Dr Laura Farris with me now. You're here more often than I am at the moment. It's good to see you, as always. What's your plan for deep fakes? Well, we are today announcing that we're cracking down on the creation of sexually explicit deep fake images. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I think we are the first national government anywhere in the world to make this an offence. You'll probably recall that under the Online Safety Act, it's already an offence to share deep fake images. You can go to prison for doing that. But we have been listening really carefully to women's groups and campaigners. And we think that the act of creating this material is not only inherently misogynistic, but an offence in itself. We're hearing more and more stories, yes, of well-known people, but also of ordinary people whose lives have been ruined by incredibly humiliating, degrading, misogynistic content that has been manufactured, their face, it's not them, and it's circulated online. And one of the things, actually, we've been saying, that in this country, it is a criminal offence to build an explosive device, even if you do it in the privacy of your own kitchen and you say, you know, it was never going to be used. And we say that because if it, if it falls into the wrong hands, or if the motive of the person changes, it could have catastrophic consequences. We think the same is true of creating deep fake images. If it falls into the wrong hands, if motive changes, it can have a very damaging psychological effect, and we are stamping down on that. Will you be reading Liz Truss's memoir? Uh, I, I wasn't planning to. Why not? Well, um, look, I know that she wants to vindicate her time in office and I'm, I'm not disrespecting uh, that, but I perhaps don't agree with everything that she has to say. Uh, the Lib Dems are saying that she's a national embarrassment. What do you think about her? No, I'm not going to get into personal criticisms. I know that she has an account of her time in office, what she thinks happened. She could have cost you the next election. Um, look, you know, um, I've always been very, very supportive of the Prime Minister. I backed him, actually, when he, he stood in the leadership, and I'm, I'm, you know, very pleased with his leadership, so, yeah. OK, I'll let you off with that one. <laughs> um, talk to me about the IRGC. Um, yeah. Should they um, be a banned organisation as far as the British government is concerned? Well, look, look, Kay, no one is denying... I should say Iranian Republican Guard for people who aren't aware of the mm. acronym. Yeah, and nobody is denying that they are a malign force. We have repeatedly sanctioned both individual commanders and the IRGC more generally, so that puts very severe restrictions on their ability to move and on other... Um, on other freedoms that they would have had. And we're not suggesting that they're not a problem. I think I saw David Cameron was on your show yesterday. He was. And one of the things he's been saying more widely is that at the moment we have a direct diplomatic channel, a, a direct line of communication to Tehran, even though relations are difficult and there is a, those conversations are not always easy there is actually something positive about being able to have face-to-face -face diplomatic relations. And at this point in time, there is something for that. But look, the Prime Minister said he made a statement to the House yesterday. He's been talking very closely with all his G7 counterparts. He spoke to Benjamin Netanyahu yesterday too. All of this stuff remains under review. Uh, all of it is part of what's being considered along with further sanctions. So... But should we be communicating in that way with a terrorist group, basically, which is what so many people are suggesting that they are? I'm not, as I say, I'm not suggesting that they're not a problematic presence. But there is something, and this is what David Cameron spoke about, and as Foreign Secretary, this is, I think, something that he'll have a direct sense of. There is something important about being able to have a direct communication, even with the most difficult states. And, you know, one of the things, Kay, and you'll know this better than anyone, this is a, a unique moment of tension in the Middle East and for the wider region. Everything is focused on cool heads, avoiding de-escalation. And at this point in time, the, the Foreign Secretary has said he values having a direct channel of communication to Tehran. As I say, They're we already we though, already sanction them, though. It's, more it's, than problematic. I, look, I accept that, but we already impose sanctions on them. It's, it remains under review. So, um, you, I, you know... You're, I don't think there's any disagreement on the principle of what you're saying, Kay, simply that this is something that is being worked through with the G7 partners. Uh, Liam Fox said last night that Iran orchestrated the crisis in Gaza because it didn't like the normalisation of, of relations between Israel and Arab states. In other words, they're poking the bear. Um, is that your view? Do you agree with what he's saying? Look, I think that is a sensible construction of some of the impulses that's, that, that lay behind October the 7th. But it is extraordinary to see the 
seriousness of the attack on Saturday night, the, you know, the, the, more than 300 missiles were, were, were focused on Israel. If they hadn't been intercepted, they would have had catastrophic consequences or loss of life. But there they were... did give 48 hours notice. They did, but if they hadn't been intercepted, that was ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, some of the most serious arsenal that you can possibly if they, use. If they meant for them to cause significant harm, why would they have given notice? It is not guaranteed that the defence system would have worked perfectly. It is absolutely manifestly clear that if you fire 300 of the most serious arsenal at any state, it is an, it is an extreme act of aggression. I understand and that, that, but it I, could wonder why, in, I wonder why they gave life. so much notice, do you think? Well, look... Um, we know that this is an intensifying issue. That's why the Prime Minister has called for cool heads. He's av everything is focused on avoiding an escalation. But it is very shocking. You know, Iran has done this in its own backyard. These are Middle Eastern countries that yeah. are now... So it was an act of terrorism, and yet, potentially, and yet you won't say that the IRGC is a terrorist group? Well, I've said that they are a malign force. We have been sanctioning them periodically since 2021, 2022, 2023. I was looking at the sequence of the sanctions and actually we know, for example, they had involvement in Russia in supplying weapons that were used in Ukraine. So we have been taking very tough measures with them. And this is not... But those a final... that would do their bidding in the form of Hamas, who say that they are terrorists... Yes, but there's a different context there. Hamas isn't simply a tool of the IRGC. Uh, Hamas has, and Hezbollah have a different relationship with Israel and that's something that has a slightly different context. But, as I say, the effort within the Foreign Office and the MOD is on working closely with our G7 partners and with the State of Israel and, indeed, through direct channels to Tehran to try and take the heat out of this so that cool heads prevail at this moment. Are you confident that the Rwanda bill will pass this week? I'm hopeful, very hopeful. Are you confident? I am reasonably confident, yes. OK, so when will the planes go? I know... I understand what you're saying, that this has taken a long time. More than but, two years. Yes. But the thing that is holding us back, OK, are not operational logistics. We, we've been working on this So you've got an airline months. to take people now? We... When the legislation is through, we will be getting flights off as soon as possible, but it is not the operational logistics holding us up. It is the legislative logjam, and that's been caused at the moment by the Lords who have sent it back to us on more than one occasion. So but you do have an airline to take people? We are... We have been planning for this for that's logistics. Months. We are... We are very close to being able to do this. We, we are... In... in so you, you almost have an airline to take people? I'm not going to comment on the precise details, Kay, but we... I'm not asking for precise details. I'm just saying, is there an airline that will be taking people as soon as it, it becomes law? We have operational... We are operationally very close to being ready to do this. That is not what's holding us up. What's holding us up is the passage of the legislation, and I hope that this will meet... You know, this will be the final week. But if I can just say one thing, Kay... This legislation is a question of fairness. We are a big-hearted nation. We've taken over half a million refugees since 2015 from some of the most, you know, conflict-ridden countries in the world, whether that's, oh, that's Syria, Turkey. Afghanistan, Ukraine. The small boats is a different issue. It is, you know, every single person who makes that crossing has had the journey facilitated by a yep. people smuggler. They've paid money. 80% of them are young men. It is the first time a government has said... If you arrive here illegally, you cannot remain in the United Kingdom. Not deterring Kingdom. them, though, is and, it? Well, we haven't been able to do it yet. But actually, it is a deterrent to say... Because the reason they do it is because they believe they will get to stay here. And this is the first time we've been able to say... And we'll 50% keep you safe. of people who come are allowed to stay? Uh, we will keep you safe, but we will put you in a safe third country. You'll be relocated safely to Rwanda. And, look, th the will of the House of Commons is that this should go through, and we hope that the Lords are willing to accept the democratically elected... And if I can just press you finally, Minister, on whether or not you have an airline in the wings that is ready to take people to Rwanda, or is it going to be the RAF? OK, I'm not going to comment on specific details, but as it's I say... It's not a specific detail, Minister. It's, have you got an airline in the wings? Is it going to be the RAF? As I say, we are, we, are opera we have operationally been preparing for this for months. It is not the logistics that is holding us back. It is the fact that the law is not on the statute book. OK. It's good to see you, Minister. You As too. always, thank you, you very too. much. Nice, nice to join us. You. Thank you.